Welcome everyone to CSA Courtroom and also the closing lecture for Space Time Quantum Mechanics Workshop. It's our pleasure to have Nima as a speaker today and he will talk about time without time. Yeah, I will refrain from making all the jokes about the title of the subject and the length of my talks that we need to be made, uh, but uh, I will not, not make them. Um, so, <clears throat> I was uh, thinking well, we've had this uh, wonderful workshop for the past uh, number of days, and, and also this whole program for this uh, semester that's been stupendous fun for me uh, at least so far. Um, but I was thinking about what to uh, talk about for this uh, colloquium, that was why the sort of title changed at the end, that would. Um, that would both be interesting to the people who have not been attending the workshop um, and also not sort of boring and old hat to people who have been attending the workshop. So I decided to talk about um, uh, a subject that's very closely related morally, spiritually, uh, to the things that have been going on in the, at the intersection of the physics and mathematics of scattering amplitudes and positivity, cluster algebras, poly logs, motives, all this wonderful stuff on the one side. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but which actually extends beyond that in physics to an even richer set of questions. And I have to say that this set of questions uh, was what actually drew me and myself into the subject around 15 years ago, uh, 12 years ago, um, is that I actually spent a number of kind of fruitless years thinking about <coughs> cosmology. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of fascinating questions about cosmology and eternal inflation and the multiverse and all kinds of things like that that we're not going to talk about today, um, which uh, uh, I and many other people got nowhere with for many years. Uh, and then I, I gradually started realizing that there are simpler cousins of these questions involving the physics of scattering amplitudes. And so that's where uh, it's been, at least in this direction, my, my intellectual home for the last uh, 10 years or so. But slowly by slowly, we're, we're some of us are starting to head back in the cosmological direction, which was the ultimate um, motivation and uh, driver for a lot of these uh, questions. And so this subject is absolutely in its infancy relative to what's going on with uh, amplitudes. Um, but nonetheless, I hope you see that there is a strong uh, connection and that we're really starting to see analogous but richer uh, structures uh, in the study of cosmology that, uh, that, that we've seen in uh, the uh, mathematics and physics of uh, scattering amplitudes. <clears throat> and uh, since this is such, uh, such a kind of uh, subject in very infancy of, of its development, there are many things that are sort of going on at once right at the beginning. If you know anything about the physics of the scattering amplitudes, and I will uh, quickly review it, um, the whole history of that subject, uh, uh, and it, it continues today, has sort of two parts. One of them is what you can think of as uh, gathering of data, gathering of theoretical data, just learning how to do calculations, seeing all kinds of miraculous simplifications and properties in uh, scattering amplitudes, many of which were motivated by experiment. They are motivated because people actually needed to get the answers to compare theory and experiment, and horrendous sums of Feynman diagrams collapsed to incredibly simple expressions, and those in turn were the seed for begging for an interpretation of some underlying structure that explained where they came from. So there's this virtuous cycle where uh, there's experiment hovering in the background all the time. That's important if you're a physicist. Um, but it tells you, learn to do these calculations. We need them. Uh, you do them standardly. They're horrendously complicated. But you do them, and you're rewarded by seeing some great simplicity in the answer. Then suggests some surprising mathematical structure behind it. That once you know what it is, let's do a lot more calculations. And you go back, and you're able to gather more theoretical data and see more surprising structures, and the subject goes on and on. Okay, so that's been going on now for like two or three decades in the study of scattering amplitudes, and we're essentially uh, at, the, um, at the beginning of that process, roughly where amplitudes was 20 or 30 years ago, with analogous questions in the context of cosmology. And so both kinds of things are developing simultaneously in the subject. On the one hand, there's work that is uh, essentially using basic physical principles, symmetries, and singularities to determine uh, the analog of scattering amplitudes in cosmology, I'll define what they are. These are cosmological correlation functions. 
Um, so this is a subject you can sort of loosely call the cosmological bootstrap program in, in uh, analogy to the S-matrix bootstrap program. And then there's a more mathematical side of the subject that starts to see surprising patterns in these objects that you started learning calculating. And as we've seen in the context of scattering amplitudes, uh, where these, uh, these patterns are associated with interesting geometric structures, so we're just starting to see very baby early versions of the kind of structures we've been talking about in this workshop, amphitohedra, sosahedra, things like that. There are very small cousins of those things in the context of cosmology that, uh, that we ran into a number of years ago with uh, Alex Posnikov and Paolo Van that we call cosmological polytopes, uh, and we learned uh, more uh, about them. So again, the subject is so new that these things but in, in the sort of world of amplitudes, there's some industry that develops data, there's some industry that thinks about mathematical structures by now. Here, everything we have to do at the same time. We've got to do it ourselves because no one's doing it. Um, so this stuff is being done in collaboration with uh, Daniel uh, Bauman, Hayden Lee, who's sitting right here, and Guy Pimento, uh, and this about these set of All right, so, okay, so backdrop. Uh, <clears throat> we learned in... Uh, in physics, really going back to the 1960s, there was a, this, this qualitative realization, but, but we understood uh, uh, really profoundly a little over 20 years ago, that when you have quantum mechanics and gravity, uh, the kind of observables that you're allowed to talk about don't live in, uh, in the interior of space-time. Um, when you have quantum gravity, everything is sort of fluctuating. Space-time points are even fluctuating. You can't talk about things like Correlation functions involving a point in space-time here, there, 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 because even the, lo the location of the points is not quantum mechanically well defined. The only things you can do is go to places where you can anchor experiments at infinity with infinitely large measuring apparatuses that can do experiments over and over again. Um, and so the only observables in, uh, when you have quantum mechanics and gravity live at, at the boundaries of space-time. And um, uh, the way that this has been understood to work the best, and it's ongoing to understand better and better, um, but we saw this sort of incredible fact already 20 years ago, is in the closest cousin you can make when you have a gravity to a universe in a box. If you have anti de Sitter space, it's like having a universe in a box. Uh, uh, really, anti de Sitter space looks like this, uh, this uh, tin can. The curvature inside the tin can is... Uh, uh, is negative, and that curvature has the interesting property that the proper distance from any point on the inside to the boundary is infinite, but it takes light a finite amount of time to bounce off the boundary and come back into the ball. You can really think of it as kind of the inside of an infinitely strong potential that gets uh, bigger and bigger if you head out to the uh, boundary, but light doesn't see it. It just goes and bounces, bounces off the walls. Okay, so in this context, the kind of observables you can talk about are to ping things on the Outside of this tin can, naively, you know, you would just ping the outside of the tin can, waves would go inside, crash into each other, come back out, and you'd measure the kind of correlations uh, between the, uh, you'd measure correlation functions on the boundary of the tin can. That's the only kind of observable that you can talk about. And the amazing realization of the past uh, uh, 20 years, a little over 20 years ago, is that not only does the experiment start and end at infinity, but in a very precise sense, uh, you can sort of think that there's no inside at all, that there's a theory that just lives on the walls of the box that gives you the answer to this question that's framed on the walls of the box. And in this way of thinking about things, quantum mechanics is king. There's some kind of quantum field theory that lives on the boundary of this anti de Sitter space, which is asymptotically a kind of conformal field theory in the ultraviolet. And out of the strong dynamics of this uh, quantum mechanical system emerges space and gravity and strings and all the rest of the anti de Sitter space uh, on, on the inside. All right, so this is an, an incredible thing. It's continuing to be understood more and more. But one thing I want to stress about it is that this is not a picture of emergent space time. It's a picture of emergent space. And this is really important. Uh, this is it's an example of a duality. Dualities are amazing things, but they're not completely insane things. They give you equivalence between two ordinary physical systems that otherwise have ordinary words that we associate with them. Here's an ordinary physical system involving gravity and time evolving in the future. Another ordinary physical system involving quantum field theory, time evolving into the future. And the systems are surprisingly equivalent to each other. But they're both ordinary standard physical systems with standard language for talking about time evolution. Time is not emergent in this picture. OK? And that's the biggest difference between this picture and the real world. So uh, the real world is very far from that. 
We are very far from these observables who live on the outside of a tin can. We live on the inside of a giant cosmology, cosmological universe. Okay. So first of all, at zeroth order, we live on the inside. So at zeroth order, we, uh, we see flat space. So before doing anything else, uh, uh, the universe we see around us looks like flat space. The analog of these observables that live at infinity in flat space are scattering amplitudes. Okay. And uh, so, uh, if, if we live in asymptotically flat space, these observables that are anchored to infinity or scattering amplitudes. These scattering amplitudes are, uh, perhaps not coincidentally, also the objects that we measure when we do particle collisions in, in, in experiments. It's our best experimental handle on high energy physics. Uh, and again, uh, essentially, we are almost infinitely large compared to the little elementary particles that we're scattering. So from many points of view, they're coming in from infinity and going back out to infinity, where infinity is, you know, one meter relative to the 10 to the minus 14 centimeter size of the protons that we're scattering. Okay, so, um, so it's not, we're not quite asymptotic observable, but we're very, very, very close. All right? <clears throat> but already in this case, there's a qualitative difference between the physics of scattering amplitudes and that of these correlation function on the boundary of empty to sitter space. Here, if you're trying to find the hologram, if you're trying to find the theory that lives on the boundary uh, that directly calculates the amplitudes, instead of thinking about evolution through the interior of the space-time, you have a problem. It's not obvious what to do there. See, when you go to the boundary of empty to sitter space, it's a normal place. It's space-time, it has a metric, it has time. You know what to do there. It has a notion of locality. If someone tells you, once you get into this holographic mindset, you want to go to the boundary and you should do something there. Of course, it's a huge step to realize you should do that. But once, you, once you're in that mental space, it's obvious what to do there. You put a quantum field theory there. There's something normal to do there. There's nothing normal to do up in the boundary of Minkowski space. And we can think about this in many ways. We can think about it geometrically. The boundary of Minkowski space is like a celestial sphere that surrounds us. So you could say there's some theory that lives on that celestial sphere. That's a great thing to do. A lot of people here at Harvard are exploring it. It's a wonderful idea. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful kinematical things about it, but you go to the celestial sphere, it's not obvious what to do there. There's no obvious notion of locality, there's no obvious notion of time evolution. You can go there, but it's not obvious what to do. We've said in this workshop, certainly in my lectures earlier today, ad nauseum, that there are lots of ways of thinking about what this uh, boundary is in Minkowski space. It's sort of any way of labeling the on-shell data, the scattering process of the particles that come in and out. All these spaces seem pretty boring, just the space of n null momenta or n twister variables. There doesn't seem to be much to do there, and yet somehow you want to find a question to ask in that space whose answer has all the richness and complexity of scattering amplitudes. Okay, so that's the, that's the challenge. It's not obvious what to do this. Now, things get much worse in cosmology. So our universe is ultimately not even a flat space. It's cosmological. There was, a, there was some initial Big Bang singularity very likely deep in our past. And even more confusingly, we're accelerating today. So the universe is just is, uh, accelerating today. We're asymptoting to some center space. Here, the kind of questions you're allowed to talk about in cosmology and what you're allowed to do in cosmology are the following. Cosmology is the ultimate historical science. Um, any historical science is about doing the following funny thing. Um, uh, you have to look at patterns that you see in space today and infer the existence of a, cosmo of a historical past to give a rational accounting for them. Okay, so a paleontologist says that dinosaurs existed. Why? No one was around when dinosaurs existed. But we say that dinosaurs exist because you see these funny patterns of big bones on the ground. With big bones, with maybe little bones inside them, it looks like a dinosaur ate a smaller dinosaur or something like that. Okay, so there's some strange spatial patterns that you see today, and we infer a history in order to give a rational accounting of it. Or a detective is also a historical uh, scientist. A detective say that person A murdered person B yesterday because today they find the bullet from the gun belonging to person A in the stomach of person B. Okay, so that's a pattern in space today that we give some accounting for, uh, uh, some history for, to give a rational accounting of. And cosmology is just that on steroids. No one was around in the early universe. Nothing existed. I mean, no structures existed in the early universe. And yet we say all of this stuff happened. There used to be, there was a Big Bang, there was a hot Big Bang, the universe cooled, we made elements, we did all this wonderful stuff, stars, galaxies, stars, and all that stuff, in order to explain something we see around us, the clumpy world we see around us with stars, and this much helium, and this much hydrogen, and all this stuff are patterns we see in space that we give a, integrate in a history to give a rational accounting of. 
So here are the objects we talk about are all we get to do is lie on our back and look at the sky and just look at spatial averages, <coughs> right? So uh, when I say that, uh, that I understand how much what the helium fraction in the universe is, I'm really doing a spatial average. And what, how many helium molecules here compared to hydrogen? How many here? How many here? How many here? And I average that number over all the boxes in the entire universe. I take that spatial average, and that's a number that I try to try to predict. Okay, in cosmology, we try to do other things. I look at the cosmic microwave background, and we have what looks at zeroth order like a homogeneous sky with the same temperature everywhere. But when you look in detail, there is a one part in 100,000 difference between the temperature there and there and there and there and there. And that one part in 100,000 difference meant somewhere was a little hotter, somewhere was a little colder, and that gives rise to all the structure we see around us today. Because where it was a little hotter, there's a little bit more matter. When the universe cooled, that little more matter started to clump under the force of gravity and eventually turned into the galaxies and stars and planets and everything else that we see around us. So these tiny fluctuations in the temperature we see in the cosmic microwave background is the origin of all the structure in the world today. And that's also something we can compute a two-point function for. Okay, so again, I take the temperature variation here times there, and I, uh, uh, if I take literally these two points, I get some random number, but I average over all the positions on the sky, keeping that uh, separation vector fixed, and that gives me a certain two-point function that's a function of that separation. Okay, so these are all the kinds of objects we can compute that we can measure in cosmology. They're spatial averages. Cosmological correlations is also what they're called. And the thing that computes them, here it's the S matrix for flat space scattering amplitudes. Here it's the object that's pretentiously called the wave function in the universe. So we want to compute the wave function in the universe, which is the thing that's going to give us the correct weighting for every possible spatial configuration we can see, so that we can average all of them to get expectation values for what we expect. All right? But in these questions, which are much closer to the real world, here we have a real challenge because we don't know what to do. Right? There is no obvious question to ask on the boundary here. There's an even less obvious question what to ask here. There's, no, there's nothing even that looks like time. It's only spatial up here. Okay? So what kind of question can you ask directly in the boundary, which gives you the answers that we normally ascribe to time evolution and the existence of the pot Big Bang and all, all, all the rest of it? That's the nature of the question. And I think it's clear that whatever is going on with these questions, it's not going to be like we saw in ADS-CFD, where quantum mechanics is king and space is emergent. There's something, I think, in fact, a lot of people think probably more radical going on, is that there's some other structure we don't yet know about. And out of it will emerge something that has time in it. And it's very likely that that thing will come along together with quantum mechanics. So it's not like quantum mechanics is king and space emerges, but there's some stranger ideas that, that we're just maybe perhaps getting glimpses of, out of which will emerge sort of hand in hand the physics that we normally associate with quantum mechanics and space time. Very much of what's been going on in this uh, program all semester and in this workshop is seeing very specific examples of this phenomenon, very concrete examples of this phenomenon, where you ask certain combinatorial or geometric questions in this kinematic space of infinity for scattering amplitudes, and the, math and the answer to these interesting mathematical questions spit out functions that have all the properties that we normally ascribe to local evolution, uh, local unitary evolution in space-time. So in a very precise way, you see the rules of quantum mechanics and space-time come out of some more uh, abstract uh, combinatorial geometric questions. And so what I'd like to talk about today is the analog of this in cosmology from a number of points of view. Okay, but if I go back to this uh, question for uh, amplitudes, um, uh, in the case of amplitudes, we ask, what is the question in this uh, kinematic space at infinity whose answer is the scattering amplitudes? And what we don't want is the conventional answer, which is local and unitary evolution in space-time. We want some other answer, something else in there, um, and similarly for cosmology, we would have pictures like this. And I'm surely going to be describing the situation in inflationary cosmology, where a lot of these things become sharks. But literally, uh, in, in the context of uh, uh, in the context of inflation, um, uh, all of the correlations we see around us today were generated by quantum mechanical fluctuations very, very early in the universe, and these quantum mechanical fluctuations were stretched out by the inflationary exponential expansion of the universe to turn into the macroscopic, uh, uh, macroscopic fluctuations and correlations that we see today. So that's the 
in the context of inflation, this becomes a very, very sharply posed question where you ask uh, questions about correlation functions in a quantum field theory during inflation, and those quantum mechanical correlation functions, this is one of the greatest stories in science, these little quantum mechanical fluctuations get stretched out by the inflationary expansion of the universe to turn into literally the hot and cold spots in the sky that give rise to you and me. Okay? Uh, so, but in that context, in order to calculate these cosmological correlations today, we would just do Feynman diagram calculations again, just like we would for amplitudes. Now they're a little different because all of these lines in the Feynman diagrams have to end on some final time when we make the measurement today. <coughs> okay, so, uh, but once again, there are some sort of spatial correlations you would see in some late time surface. Um, and what we normally ascribe to time evolution in the past, and now we want to ask, is it possible to get that as the answer to a different question where we don't talk about the, the, the time evolution part at all? All right, so, all right, so now let's get to the, uh, let's get to the uh, part of the matter. And I want to begin with, um, with, uh, with the more practical part of this subject. Again, uh, as with amplitudes, there's an aspect of this subject which is really directly related to experiment and directly related to experiments that are going to take place on the time scale uh, of uh, sort of 20 or 30 years. So not in the infinitely far, far future. And this has to do with a very precise analogy between, a <coughs> uh, very precise analogy between, uh, uh, between uh, cosmology and ordinary particle physics, uh, collider physics, that Juan Montesano and I, a number of years ago, uh, called cosmological collider physics. So, Let's think about ordinary particle collisions. Okay. So um, uh, how do we think about ordinary particle collisions? Well, when, when we do, when we have uh, uh, usual colliders, we first have to decide who the stable particles are that we get to collide. Right? We don't get to collide on stable particles. So the first item of business is to determine which things have large two-point functions. You have to have a large two-point. What does the two-point function mean? For it to be large, it means if you put something here, you wait some time, it doesn't disappear. The two-point function is big. If you have an unstable particle, you put it here, you wait 10 seconds, it's gone. So the two-point function vanishes exponentially with time. Right? But if you have a stable particle, it's a large two-point function. So the first thing you do is determine who has the big two-point functions, which is the fancy way of saying who are the stable particles. Once you know who they are, what the actual two-point functions are are not that exciting by themselves, because they're almost entirely determined by symmetries. And so you have Lorentz invariance and translational invariance, you know what all the two-point functions are. All the excitement has to do with looking at nonlinearities involving these guys. We collide them together, maybe we make some new particles, and things come out, and from the pattern of what we get when we collide the particles in and things come out, we infer something about the presence of new massive particles, let's say. Okay, so, for example, if you're a particle physicist, you would collide particles, protons at the Large Hadron Collider, or electrons and positrons at E plus E minus machines, um, and you make resonances, you make the Z particle or other particles, and that shows up in the overall rate for making particles of the giant spike at a given energy, and then some things come out, and by looking at the pattern of things that come out, you infer something about the particle that you made. Okay, the story is almost identical in cosmology. Very often when journalists talk about inflation, again, inflation is this, uh, this, uh, 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 hypothetical uh, period very early in the history of the universe when the universe um, underwent exponential expansion, exponentially rapid expansion. I said already that takes the tiny quantum mechanical fluctuations and it stretches them out to become uh, macroscopic and turn into the, uh, turn into the um, inhomogeneities and the fluctuations that we see today. Um, but there too, there's a field that's uh, associated with uh, inflation, the, uh, the infoton. Um, and it has a large two-point function. That large two-point function is exactly, or relatively large two-point function, that's the 10 to the minus 5 fluctuation that we see across the size today. 10 to the minus 5 is not a very big number, but the fluctuation is macroscopic. We see it across the entire sky. It's not averaging out or canceling out with position. Okay, so that's a large two-point function. Also, the early inflationary period of the universe is associated with uh, symmetries much like flat spaces. These are the sitter symmetries because the universe was nearly the sitter space, or more precisely, approximate uh, the sitter symmetries. Once you believe that there was that early phase with approximate the sitter symmetries that makes a number of experimental predictions, all of which have been confirmed, um, uh, once, once you believe that, then there's not too much interesting about the two-point function itself, 
But you can again look for nonlinearities. Nonlinearities here mean that you look for a three-point function. So but when we look at the sky today, it really looks like Gaussian noise. Okay, so it just looks like there is no there's just two-point correlations, but there's no three-point correlations. But it could be that there's a very small effect that's a three-point correlation. That's if it's like hotter there and hotter there, then maybe it's always colder here, on average colder here, right? So we haven't seen that yet, but that's something that experimentalists are looking for, and they have a whole program to look for in the coming 20 or 30 years. These are the analogs of scattering amplitudes, of scattering collider physics experiments. But now, if the scale of inflation is very high, it could be as high as 10 to the 14 GeV, which is just four orders of magnitude smaller than the Planckian energy, and also like 11 orders of magnitude bigger than anything we can achieve on Earth, okay, then it's possible that by looking at the patterns in these uh, nonlinearities, we can learn something about particles that might be as heavy as that. Not by looking at patterns of uh, sprays of crap coming out of the collisions of particles, but by looking at subtle correlations in how the densities of galaxies on large scales are correlated with each other. All right, so that's the, that's the, that's the program. So the, the potential new particles are seen as patterns in cosmological correlates. All right, so let's talk in a little bit more detail about uh, what these correlation functions look like. Where imagine this, this uh, eta is a variable that's, uh, that's a time variable. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> and uh, the sort of most basic thing that you would imagine, so you have some underlying uh, Disorder phase, all of these calculations are done in an approximate uh, uh, disorder space. And what they give rise to at late times, which is where we're doing the measurement, is some two point function. That would literally just be some sort of free, free propagator. Maybe if there's some interaction, there would be some corrections that look like that, or that, or more complicated things. Um, and so, in general, what you would experimentally do is just measure the temperature fluctuation or the density fluctuation at different points in space and literally average them, keeping all these, all the separations fixed, you average them, and you get a function, so, sorry, those shouldn't be pluses, those should be commas, to be functioned of a bunch of spatial momenta when you Fourier transform to momentum space. It's useful to the Fourier transform because we have translational invariance. So we Fourier transform to momentum space, we get a function of a bunch of momentum variables on the support of just spatial momentum conservation. So that's the data. So you give me a bunch of n K, uh, n three-dimensional vectors in momentum space. They have to add up to zero, so I can draw them to look like the size of a polygon. With one of these polygons, there's some number. Okay, that's it. That's, those, those are the objects that uh, we're, we're interested in talking about. And now notice that, of course, a particle physicist would interpret the exactly the same picture and say, oh, I have two particles coming in and two particles going out, and the momentum balance each other. So a particle physicist would interpret exactly the same data as giving you a scattering process, with one important difference, a particle physicist thinks that these are particles that have energy, and that energy is also conserved in this process. Whereas here, there's no, there's no notion of energy. The time translational invariance of the problem is broken by the fact that we're looking at these, uh, at these objects at a fixed time, so there's no analog of energy conservation. Okay? So, in fact, these cosmological correlators depend on one extra variable, precisely one extra variable relative to scattering amplitudes. They depend on exactly a bunch of k momenta that add up, spatial momenta that add up to zero, but we're not imposing that the sum of all the energies adds up to zero. Okay? Now, here's a technical remark for the cognoscenti, um, which is that uh, I told you that inflation it's a period that's not quite exactly the invariant because, it, because of, uh, uh, this underlying inflationary phase where the universe is exponentially expanding eventually ends. So that means that, it, that it's not exactly at the symmetries of the Desiderate space. But, uh, but it's reasonable to assume that, the, that, that it's weakly broken because this, this, uh, this phase lasts for a reasonably long time. Um, and so there's a very precise way in which you can get the results from inflation, let's say for a three-point function for inflation, is secretly a four-point function in the in in uh, in an exact uh, uh, disorder background. So if, if we think about these uh, fields phi as being these uh, inflaton fields, then if I compute a four-point function in disorder space, there's a particular limit where I send the momentum associated with this leg to zero, uh, which essentially puts it on the inflationary background and turns this four-point function in the center space into the three-point function in inflation. So when we talk, the kind of dominant thing that we'll be talking about experimentally 
Uh, hopefully, people will look for these non gaussianity associated with uh, three point functions. Um, but these three point functions are really secretly what look like four point functions from the perspective of the underlying um, uh, consider space. All right, here's another qualitative point. I think this is a, a technically extremely simple point, but it's sort of mind blowing. Um, these cosmological observables, as, I, as I've stressed, are completely static things. You sit there, you look on the sky, you average, you're doing nothing. Okay? You're just uh, doing these spatial averages. And one of the, this is, I'm just reiterating the big underlying conceptual problem of this entire subject is what are the rules? If I hand you, I say, here, I'm done. Here's the wave function of the universe. Thank you very much. Check. Am I right or wrong? I have no idea how we're supposed to check if you're right or wrong in general. I don't know. Uh, what property of this wave function encodes the fact that it comes from, at least in some approximation, it comes from unitary time evolution in the interior. Okay, we have the analog of this question for scattering amplitudes, where also we don't know the answer, but we're much further along to figuring it out. Okay, it's, again, everything is more primitive in this subject. So, uh, I don't know how to check. But here's at least one property that it has to have. This is a remarkable property, which is that this, uh, the wave function of the universe actually contains the scattering amplitudes, literally contains them, uh, in some analytic continuation. So I told you that these objects are richer than amplitudes. They're not just richer, they contain amplitudes are part of them. And this is how it works. Remember I told you that, uh, that, we, that nothing forces these energies to add up to zero. Okay? And they're in fact not energies. What I mean by energy is the magnitude of all these spatial momenta. Okay, so in the physical region where there are Euclidean momenta, they're all positive, and that's, that's that. However, I can analytically continue, uh, if, I, if I have the formula for the wave function, I can analytically continue so that some of the energies are positive and some of them are negative so that they can add up to zero. And if I do that, what's happening is that I can develop a singularity, or a pole, or, or other kind of singularity, when all these energies add up to zero, and that singularity precisely comes from the region when I... When I uh, compute these Feynman diagrams, where all the times go off to minus infinity together. In that limit, this calculation has no idea that the boundary is here. And therefore, the kind of coefficient of this singularity is exactly what I would get from a scattering amplitude. See, it's really cool that if you tune the energies to add up to zero, the wave function develops a singularity. And the residue on that singularity, now it makes sense to talk about the energies add up, adding up to zero. And what else could it possibly be other than the scattering amplitude? Okay, so these cosmological wave functions contain scattering amplitudes as a part of them, and they can <coughs> more. So that's one of many consistency conditions. If I hand you some random wave functions, hey, I'm done, here's a wave function of the universe. What do I do with it? I check it's normalizable. Great. What else do I do with it? Well, one thing I can do with it is look to see if I can analytically <coughs> continue and see that I find this pole, and on the pole I get a sensible scattering amplitude. Okay, so that's a humongous constraint, a massive, massive constraint <coughs> on the structure of these uh, objects. There are probably many, many more. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> let me then say again what what the uh, what the what uh, the twin challenges of uh, of this uh, enterprise are. So the big question is, what are the rules that determine the wave function of the universe? And question number one is, how is consistent unitary time evolution physics encoded in these late time correlators? So again, just what we said already. You hand me the answer. How can I check whether the answer is somehow compatible, even roughly, with, uh, with uh, arising from ordinary standard uh, time evolution? And then there is the sort of cousin question, the kind of more adventurous question, which is, um, is there some autonomous objects that sort of satisfies these rules and generates these answers without bulk time evolution? Okay. So, so again, this is the analog of learning, if you're an amplitude person, learning how do you use on shell methods to calculate scattering amplitudes without Feynman diagrams. This is, is there something like a uh, sosahedra or amphitahedra or whatever, something like that, or a string world sheet which computes these things without standard time evolution. Okay. In the context of amplitude, I've sort of said this already. The first part uh, uh, is actually associated with this uh, program that goes back to the 1960s. You can think of it as the S matrix bootstrap. And the idea is to exploit locality and unitarity, to tell you something about the symmetries and singularities of the amplitude, and determine the amplitudes without Feynman diagrams. Okay? And there's actually a very, very easy part of this. I've actually given you the entire answer here. 
Um, and, and experimentalists in the 1960s knew this in their sleep. Um, let's say I want to know what is the four particle amplitude where I have some particles on the outside, let's say scalars, and they're interacting with a completely general, I don't know what the particle is, I just know it has spin S and has mass M. What can I say about the sort of leading tree amplitude that I can have for this guy? And maybe if you're just taking quantum field theory, you're very scared, you have to learn the Feynman rules, my god, for a spin 100 particle, it's going to be very complicated. But you don't actually have to do a damn thing, because the answer is 100% fixed by symmetry. You have to have a pole when s goes to m squared, and on the residue of the pole, you have to see the s Legendre polynomial of the scattering angle. Okay, that's completely fixed by symmetries and singularities. So this part is trivial, and in fact, it's essentially what experimentalists did in the 1960s in order to figure out what masses and spins of particles they were seeing without theorists telling them what to do. They didn't need theorists for this part, because they could just figure out themselves ahead of time what the answer uh, had to look like from symmetries and singularities. So this part is easy, and the frontier today, uh, what we need to calculate amplitudes for the Large Hadron Collider, are multi-leg, multi-loop, five particles, two loops, kind of fancy schmancy stuff. Uh, and it's actually needed. It's actually needed to interpret experimental results uh, from Hadron Collider. What's the analog of this in cosmology? So that's what we're going to try to uh, uh, develop. So <clears throat> the first thing we'd like to do is learn how to calculate these inflationary correlators from symmetries and singularities. And it's the analog of, of uh, amplitudes uh, without ever talking about virtual particles, only talking about on-shell processes. Similarly here, we want to get the physics of time without time. And we want to somehow determine the answer directly from symmetries and singularities on the boundary without ever talking about the time evolution. And just so you understand that I was not kidding when I said the subject in its, in its infancy, the frontier, as of a little over a year ago when we wrote our paper, was this diagram. Okay? Just this diagram in cosmology. The exchange of a particle of mass m and spin s between two scalars in the center space was not known. Okay? You can write down some expression, but no one has any idea really what its content was, how you're supposed to think about it, how you're supposed to evaluate it, and so on. So now we have both some analytic understanding of it, but also more importantly, a conceptual understanding of how it arises from symmetries and singularities. Okay? And but doing this is needed to interpret uh, the searches that are going to be done for non-Gaussianities in the coming decades uh, as cosmological collider physics. So our experimental friends are going to do all these measurements, figure out, look for these subtle small signals, and it's very useful for us to tell them quite precisely what to look for. And if we knew how to do these calculations in a totally model-independent way, then we can give them useful templates to be able to compare with experiment. And so that's the, uh, that's the aspect of it which actually is relevant to experiment. All right, so that's the, that's the bootstrap part. The, uh, the, the more geometric mathematical part is on the side of amplitudes to try to discover locality and unitarity, space-time and quantum mechanics is arising from some more primitive notions. And we can try to look for the same thing in the context of cosmology. And there, um, uh, we're, as I said, we're just beginning to see that uh, in the context of these objects called cosmological polytopes. But I want to say one qualitative thing that this thing needs to do, which I think is completely fascinating. And uh, already in this very baby example, we can see uh, uh, where it would come from. Um, <clears throat> something that we emphasize all the time uh, as high energy physicists is the crucial importance of the principles of relativity and quantum mechanics, Lorentz invariance and unitarity. So those are humongously constraining things. If we only had one or the other, the universe would be much less constrained. We have both Lorentz invariance and unitarity, and that forces this tremendous straitjacket uh, on, our, on our imaginations about the, the way the world works and this very, very rigid structure of local quantum field theory uh, associated with it. So on the one hand, locality and unitarity are humongously important things. On the other hand, in the context of cosmology, neither one of them appears to be truly fundamental. For example, Lorentz invariance is actually broken in cosmology. The universe itself breaks Lorentz invariance. Okay? Precisely because we have this expanding universe and so on, actual universe on very large scales is not Lorentz invariant. Okay? The proof is that we know what frame we're in, because we can tell if we're moving relative to the cosmic microwave background or not. Okay? So cosmologically, Lorentz invariance is broken. 
Similarly, because we don't have any notion of time evolution for these questions, they're just completely static questions, it's not even obvious what unitarity is supposed to mean. So when we have these cosmological questions, it's sort of very puzzling. It doesn't seem like there's a place in these cosmological questions to have any exact notion of Lorentz invariance or any exact notion of unitarity on the one hand. But on the other hand, somehow they're absolutely crucial to our understanding of sort of local uh, physics on scales smaller than cosmological scales today. So whatever these objects are that are going to produce these things, they have to, on the one hand, not care about Lorentz invariance and unitarity. On the other hand, they have to give us exact Lorentz invariance and unitarity in some limit. And not a little bit deformed, a little bit broken. They have to not know about them, but produce them exactly someplace. And Given that we've seen that the Lorentz, that amplitudes live on this locus where all the energies add up to zero in the correlators, this turns into a very sharply posed mathematical requirement. That you have some object that does not know about Lorentz invariance, does not know about unitarity, which magically should become exactly Lorentz invariant and exactly unitary on these total energy going to zero poles. So that's something that any such object should do, and we can actually see how it happens in the context of these of multiple polytopes. And in fact, in so doing, along the way, we get, uh, uh, at least to my, to my thinking, uh, much more natural understanding of the, of the proof of Laurent, of especially unitarity um, for quantum field theories and perturbation theory relative to the sort of textbook proofs that go via the cutting rules. For those of you who know the presentation of T.D. Veltman in his famous textbook, there's something kind of clever and slightly ingenious about the way unitarity is proven diagrammatically in quantum field theory. That ingenuity is totally gone and is replaced by something sort of quite conceptual, uh, but from this perspective, from the perspective of cosmological polytopes rather than directly the uh, amplitudes uh, themselves. All right, I probably won't get to that. I'm really running out of time, so, uh, but I'll probably uh, just uh, have uh, enough time to uh, tell you something, at least about the first part of the story, which is already uh, Interesting. All right, so let's talk about this uh, cosmological bootstrap. <clears throat> and um, you don't need to understand any of these things in, in uh, detail. You'll see the sort of qualitative point uh, soon enough. Um, but let's first get some idea for what these non-Gaussianities are, these three-point functions that we're interested in that are supposed to reflect the presence of uh, massive particles, what they could look like. So let, let's say we have some interaction between the, the, this, class, this field phi, which is our uh, um, infoton. So it can have some sort of self-interaction that could give rise to some non-Gaussianity. Uh, and if this is some sort of uh, simple contact interaction, something is going on at very short distances but produces this as a local interaction in space-time, then it's kind of easy to see that the kind of function you're going to get is just a polynomial in these, uh, uh, in these spatial momenta. Of course, as I told you, it must have a singularity when all the energy that up to zero, because there's an amplitude associated with that. So there's always some denominator that involves the power of the sum of the energies. But apart from that, everything else is analytic in the momentum. Okay? And that reflects the fact that this is uh, some interaction that took place at one time in the bulk. Now, around 20 years ago, Juan Maldacena did an amazing calculation um, which a lot of people have tried to do before and had not gotten correct, of computing what the leading non-Gaussianity you should expect is from an inflation just from the presence of gravity. So in this, in, in the parlance of these pictures, it would just be gravitron exchange. And again, despite appearances, it's not a very simple calculation. But also quite remarkably, the answer is also has the same qualitative feature. It's just some polynomial in the spatial momenta. So it's also analytic. Now, let's say that you're exchanging some particle of mass m. Really, there's some particle of mass m. You would think that all that's going on is, well, I integrate that particle out, and I get a whole sequence, more and more uh, uh, interactions suppressed by higher and higher powers of the mass of this particle. And each one of these things will give me something that's a polynomial and analytic in all the momenta. And indeed, this is true. There's a scale. There's, a, there's an expansion scale during inflation. That scale is called H. M is the mass of the particle. And there's an expansion. If M is very heavy compared to H, that means the, the particle size is tiny compared to, the, uh, compared to the effective curvature of the universe during inflation. So there's an expansion parameter in, in H over M. And to all orders in this expansion parameter, 
The answer is analytic. And this would be an exact statement if we were talking about amplitudes. So if you know anything about, uh, you know, if you're a, if you know uh, the cross section for E plus E minus the mu plus mu minus uh, electrons and positrons go to muons and antimuons, then at leading order or tree level, this amplitude is just a polynomial at low energies. And then it develops a pole when, when, the, uh, when the center of mass energy becomes equal to the mass of the Z. But other than that, it's exactly a polynomial at, at low energy. However, this is not true in cosmology. So this is the one qualitative difference between cosmology and collider physics, is that in collider physics, we get to control the initial state. We're experimentalists. We get to control the initial state. We get to say we're going to collide the particles at this energy or that energy. We beg for more money from government so that we can do these collisions at higher and higher energies. But we get to control the initial state. We weren't around in the early universe. We don't get to control anything about the early universe. We can't control the initial state. However, there's the, there's the, the silver lining is that this was some time-dependent background. And that time-dependent background produces every particle that there is. <coughs> So despite the fact that it's not, uh, we don't get to control it, everything which is out there is actually produced at some level. The amount that it's produced could be exponentially suppressed. If it's very heavy compared to the rate at which the universe is uh, expanding, the rate at which it's produced could be very small. But nonetheless, it's produced with some amount. And so there's some probability that the particle is actually physically produced. And that's the real novelty during inflation. There is some probability that goes like e to the minus m over h that you actually produce the particle. And this is not captured by this expansion that I was talking about before. <coughs> you see it in the fact that the two-point function for massive fields, when I uh, look in position space, it has a contribution that dies like a power of the separation between the two of them. In fact, it goes like 1 over the separation cubed. That's just a statement that if you make a particle here uh, and another one there, the sort of density of their overlap dilutes like the volume as the universe expands. Right? But then there is this interesting part where it oscillates. Okay? And this oscillation is the fact that when you produce a particle, it's sitting there, and its wave function is oscillating like e to the i energy t. Okay? So that's a clock. You make this particle, it's sitting there, its wave function is oscillating, and like every clock, keeping track of its oscillations is a way of, uh, of keeping track of the time associated with it. So this thing is dilution. This thing is oscillation, and it's a fingerprint of time. The fact that we produce the particle and its phase is oscillating. Very often, people in uh, high energy physics uh, uh, talk about the fact that the symmetries of anti desitter space and desitter space are very similar. They both have a conformal symmetry on the boundary and so on. We're going to exploit that in a moment. But this is a huge physical difference between anti desitter space and desitter space. In anti desitter space, you don't see these phases because it's not time, which is the sort of direction that we're missing. It's space, which is the direction we're missing. Whereas in, in this other space, we actually see these phases. That's the clocks. There's really massive particles that we're making. And in momentum space, there are things that oscillate, uh, like k to the i mu, that again, are non-analytic in k. And you can actually see these in a particular limit. So if I'm looking at a, a three-point function, uh, here's a limit where, so these are two momenta that are, uh, that are big and one momentum that's short. This corresponds to this picture, that during inflation, a pair of particles were created. One pair went out very, very long time, and it decayed into a pair of infotons. The other went out a shorter time, and it decayed into a pair of infotons. Uh, but the fact that there is a large time separation between these two events is reflected in some phase that we get that correlates these two guys with this one that goes like the ratio of this side length to these two side lengths to the three halves plus or minus i mu. Once again, that three halves is just the overall dilution with the expansion of the universe, but this plus or minus i mu is the exciting thing. That means that if you look at these non-gauss entities and you take a limit, if you manage to see it, if you measure something, and you see that as a limit, if you take two of the momenta to be long and one of them to be short, if you see something oscillating in this pattern of non gaussianity that oscillation that you're seeing in space or in momentum space is reflecting the time evolution of this pair of particles and the large time separation between them in time during, during inflation. So again, these oscillations are like really seeing a clock 
but now, just in space, okay, just the uh, uh, just in space when we do the, the measurements today. And what Juan and I showed uh, a number of years ago is that this particular limit, where the triangle becomes very squeezed, the answer is entirely fixed by kinematics. There's essentially no dynamical content to this. This is the analog of the experimentalists in the 1960s, sort of scanning the energy to the machine and sitting right on top of a resonance. And right on top of a resonance, they could tell there's a huge spike in the cross section, and they could tell the spin of the particle by looking at the angular dependence of the stuff that came out. Similarly, here in this limit, uh, the, the, uh, the non-Gaussian takes this very, very specific form um, that involves these oscillations in a very specific phase, and even the spin of the particle is reflected in the angular dependence on this angle between the short side and the long side, which is the s Legendre polynomial of cosine theta. All right. So what we'd like to do is, uh, is now go beyond that and really figure out what the entire four-point function, three or four-point function looks like, not just in the squeeze limit, but everywhere. And one reason is conceptual. We just really like to know what these answers look like. The other one is practical, because we'd like to be able to get information from these experiments, not just in one funny limit, but everywhere. So for more generic values of the, uh, of the, um, of the, of the triangles that we're talking about. And so there's a very basic object of study that once you understand this object, we'll understand everything else. Um, uh, just the jargon is that we're going to imagine these particles are actually conformally coupled. They have a very specific mass in uh, the center space. And we're going to look at the four-point function between them exchanging a massive particle of general mass m and spin s. It turns out once you know the answer to this guy, you, you can get the answer to everything else that you're, uh, that you're interested in in, uh, in relatively straightforward ways. Uh, that in our original paper on the subject involves still some experimentation and, uh, and needless ingenuity. And uh, um, Hayden and friends are putting out a paper, I think, coming out today, um, which does it in a much more uh, uh, systematic and clear way. So, so our, our, if any of you, uh, most of you probably don't know anything about our paper, but if you have looked at it, there's a large chunks of it that involve lots of sort of cleverness, and now it's, uh, uh, it's going to be much, much clearer than that. Okay. Okay, but now, already in this limited context, we can go back and ask what property of this function for a four-point function encodes the origin from time evolution. And here, there's the analog of the fact that the amplitude to Lorentz invariant for scattering amplitudes is that in the Sitter space, when we get these correlation functions from the Sitter space, the De Sitter symmetries of the Sitter space tell us that these correlation functions that we measure on the boundaries are conformally invariant. They're invariant under the Euclidean conformal symmetry of the boundary. Okay, and anyway, there's a particular differential operator, it's a little bit complicated, that encodes the uh, conformal invariants. But just as with scattering amplitudes, when we say that in general it could be very complicated, but when we have something very simple like tree exchange, we have the sort of simplest possible analytic structure of just having a pole here. Here, too, we have to ask for the simplest possible analytic structure that satisfies this conformal invariance condition. Okay. And that simplest analytic structure, you can see that in some limit, as you make two of the sides long or the other two of the sides long, this four-point function naturally could split up into the product of two three-point functions for making something on one side, something on the other side. That's the analog of factorization that we're used to in uh, amplitude. Okay, so if you make that onsatz, <clears throat> the following remarkable thing happens. Uh, you find, so I've introduced these, uh, uh, introduced these variables, just to make our life a little simpler. I have a some four-point function, so it depends on k1, k2, k3, k4, but we're, we're going to be interested in things where things only depend on the combination k1 plus k2 and k3 plus k4, just these side lengths, and then there's this intermediate guy, k intermediate, and <clears throat> Uh, and um, u and v are defined to be, I think, k1 plus k2 over k intermediate, and uh, that's u, and v is like k3 plus k4 over k intermediate. The inverse of that. Or maybe it's the inverse, thank you. That's right. Okay. Anyway, so with this on dots, the conformal invariance equations, which are just a partial differential equation, actually uh, uh, decompose into a pair of ordinary differential equations. Okay, there's some interesting differential hypergeometric uh, uh, differential operator involved here. Um, but uh, I want to 
uh, pause and emphasize how remarkable this is. So this is the beginning of the answer to the question, how do we see time purely from boundary terms? Okay, so I've just done this measurement. I have this four-point function. It just depends on this quadrilateral. But the way we see that it has to do with time is that the function that we get has a remarkable property. If you hold these two side lengths fixed and you increase these two side lengths, they satisfy a ODE, an ordinary second order differential equation, like f equals ma, just in this variable. So that's like one time variable, just from these side lengths. Or you can hold these guys fixed and vary the other ones and they satisfy another, part, another ordinary differential equation in those variables. And what's remarkable is that there's one function of these two variables, u and v, which satisfies both ordinary differential equations from both sides. That's telling a cosmological, the story of the consistent cosmological history that can be told from the perspective what's going on is we pair produce these two particles, and this is the same history being told from the perspective of one particle or from the perspective of time evolution according to the other particle. So what's non-trivial, first, is that there is a set of ordinary differential equations, so we're seeing time as the how these functions evolve as you keep all the side lengths of this uh, polygon fixed and increase uh, some set of side lengths at a time. And secondly, the story's got to be consistent with every way of saying it. Okay, so, all right. So uh, that's what I said. It's non-trivial that the solution of one equation solves the other. Um, and in fact, that's the only thing that the conventional Feynman diagram picture is good for. Okay. So when, when we give the conventional answer for this, it's some integral. The conventional answer for this four-point function is a certain integral involving a propagator and integral over two times in this bulk. And this is a nightmare for every purpose, for calculating, for understanding, for doing anything. But it makes one thing obvious, that it's a symmetric story between the u and v sides. That is otherwise very, very difficult to work with. OK. <clears throat> But once we know what this differential equation, we can go and try to solve it. And this is actually a fun exercise, because this is not one of those uh, differential equations that you just ask Mathematica to solve. Um, uh, it doesn't have a completely standard name. After quite a, quite a while, we figured out, Hayden figured out what the name is for this, uh, some super duper generalized hypergeometric function of some sort. But it's actually kind of useless. Because what, the reason why the names of hypergeometric functions matter is we know something about the singularities and branch cuts of these objects. Okay? Um, and it's because someone in the 1800s has done the work for us to figure that out. Here, the entire point is to figure out what the symmetries and branch cuts of this object look like. That's what we're trying to understand. So it wouldn't even do us any good to borrow it from someone from the 1800s. We need to understand it ourselves. So that's actually what we did, is we understood it ourselves and then later realized that it had the name. Um, so that's a, kind of an, an obscure name as far as I remember. Anyway, the interesting thing is that the general solution to this hypergeometric equation with this interesting source has two kinds, has a number of uh, uh, singularities. There are some singularities that have good physical interpretations in terms of sort of standard factorizations of amplitudes. But there are some crappy singularities. So here's a crappy singularity where you take this quadrilateral and just it degenerates so that the uh, one, one sort of triangle here becomes folded. So if that could happen, the, 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 the solution, that, that corresponds to some logarithmic singularity that looks like log 1 minus u in one of these variables. But that has no good physical interpretation. Nothing is happening in when in some random place this triangle collapses to a zero size. So we have to put boundary conditions on these differential equations to remove the bad singularities and keep the good ones. And the beautiful thing is that asking this, so we have the symmetries. Uh, now, uh, imposing both the symmetries as well as not having anything other than obvious singularities completely fixes the answer without ever talking about bulk time evolution. Okay? And amongst other things, this, this hypergeometric equation together with these boundary conditions that allows us to completely solve uh, what it looks like by imposing the absence of unphysical singularities produces, as part of the answer, the, os the oscillatory patterns that I talked about that have to be there uh, that we normally ascribe to all of this dynamical, detailed information about a time-evolving uh, background, the production of particles, and all of that. All of that, of course, just arises as a particular solution, of, uh, as a particular feature of the solution to this uh, uh, differential equation. I don't have time to uh, explain it in detail, but this, again, in more... Vivid terms is what time without time looks like. We pose the question, 
purely on the spatial boundary of infinity. We impose symmetries and singularities, and the answer has all the features that we normally ascribe to these vivid things, like an expanding background in the universe that pair produced particles that oscillated and did all of that. We get in another way, just purely from, uh, uh, from uh, boundary consideration. Okay, and in fact, this, this allows us to get a kind of a practical formula uh, uh, that has a, uh, it's, an, it's an analytic formula, it's an infinite series expansion, but with, uh, with the overlapping uh, uh, domains of convergence, radio of convergence in all the regions that we might be interested in thinking about this. And once we have this analytic answer, we can also see the sort of beautiful thing that I told you, that this four-point correlator has a singularity at this location that corresponds to uh, when this u plus v vanishes. This is when the energy is up to zero. That's the point at which, uh, that is the point at which we expect to see the flat space scattering amplitude. And that's exactly what happens. In fact, there's an analytic structure to this whole function that begins at one end, which is the squeeze limit. And the squeeze limit where I see all these oscillations in the particle production, there is a branch cut beginning there. The branch cut ends at the other end, uh, at the point that corresponds to the flat space scattering amplitude. And that gives a direct connection between these oscillations that we see in the squeeze limit with the production of particles and the scattering amplitude that it gives rise to at the flat space result. Okay, so there's just a single object. The two ends of this branch cut are exactly the uh, are exactly the, the oscillations in the squeeze limit and the flat space scattering amplitude. And again, beautifully, you see this thing. Nowhere was there anything that looked like anything Lorentz invariant, and so on. When you go on this locus, you exactly get this Lorentz invariant combination, which is what we expect to see for flat space physics. Okay, and so I can then uh, compare the story that we're just talking about <clears throat> in cosmological collider physics, again, with ordinary collider physics. So here is, here is, a, here is a sort of a typical plot, <coughs> literally, for uh, you know, electron-positron scattering. And uh, there, is a, there is a sort of classic resonance. This is the resonance associated with the Z particle. Any particle physicists will recognize that number around 90 is the Z particle. That low energy, the cross section grows as a power, and then has this big spike, and then it dies off again. This low energy part is what you can calculate from, from the polynomial corrections or a so called effective field theory. Uh, but you really need to understand the whole thing in order to predict the whole curve. And here's the analog for the four point function in cosmology. It's exactly the same thing. There's a part that you can calculate from effective field theory, but then there's these oscillations. Okay, and so to be able to do the entire thing and match. The, the whole picture, and now hand this as something for cosmologists to go look for in the coming 20 years, um, you really need to understand the symmetries and singularities the way that I was uh, describing. Okay, all right, so I think that's probably all, all I'll say. Uh, there are some technical things after that, but once you know, once you know uh, uh, the answer for the simplest case, you can then, uh, you, can, uh, you can apply various differential operators to get the answer in complete generality. Okay, so uh, I think I'm going to have to end it at that. There's a whole second talk here about the uh, about the more um, about this uh, uh, about these interesting analogs of positive geometries for cosmology. But I hope you get a flavor of what uh, again a uh, what a what a stage of infancy this subject is in relative to other things that we've been talking about. But b how uh, exciting I think it is um, uh, uh, intellectually. Um, uh, because here, all of these issues about the emergence of space-time have the biggest payoff and the greatest teeth in the context of cosmology. Okay? So this is really where you want to know about where time comes from. Well, you know, all these things about amplitude, blah, blah, really, who cares? Um, uh, really, these existential questions about, about the world, about where it came from and what resolved the singularity and so on, um, it's really those questions that force down your throat, whether you like it or not, uh, that you should find some way of replacing time with something else, because it's the notion of time is breaking down to the Big Bang. It, you know, all this, uh, it's, uh, it's issues involving time that make it so ridiculously complicated to think about the, the uh, cosmology of uh, inflated universes and multiverses and all the rest of it. So it's these questions involving cosmology where the notion of emergent space-time has the biggest teeth 
And the mathematical objects are even richer than the ones that we've encountered in scattering amplitudes. And what I've shown you is just the baby first step in computing four-point tree amplitude. Um, then there's a, there's a program to develop to figure out how to go beyond tree level. And these things will be needed to interpret experimental results. Probably up to one loop, we'll need uh, templates to be able to interpret experimental results in the coming 20 years, on the one hand. On the other hand, given that these objects contain on this locus where the sum of the energies add up to zero, given that they contain scattering amplitudes, it seems inconceivable that all the magical structures that we see in scattering amplitudes just disappear the second you move off from this uh, locus. It's, very likely they extend to a larger, richer object, and it'll probably pay off to try to understand it more. Okay, thank you very much.